Audrey Miller, and I'm the founder and managing director of Elder Caring. Elder Caring is a geriatric care management company, and we provide advice and assistance to families dealing with elder care concerns. We have counselors who are social workers and occupational therapists, and we help uh, look at some of these very complicated issues. Um, by background, I am a social worker, a uh, life care planner, and a certified rehabilitation counselor. And I'm um, used by the courts as an expert witness to provide opinions as to what people require for um, the rest of their lives. Um, I'm also a regular blogger at All About Estates and uh, do a fair amount of writing. So um, please take a look at the sites when you have a moment. Um, <clears throat> you've heard some wonderful speakers today. And um, Leslie and, and Mark Handelman, great input and, and great reflections. And spending a day talking about elder abuse is difficult. It absolutely is difficult. Um, I've spent 30 years working as a social worker, and my talk today is on families, the good and the bad and the ugly, and what happens and when things go wrong. Um, my hope today is that you will leave here with some additional tips and resources to look at some of the triggers that, whether you are a caregiver or a care recipient, that you need to be aware about. So my talk is on tips to prevent elder abuse and neglect, how it impacts the family caregiver. Again, so whether you are a caregiver or a care recipient, this, or a friend or a family, it's all connected. So Leslie said it, it, it takes a community. Absolutely, it takes a community. And sometimes um, we know from our work with families that it's complicated. One in 12. That's the number that we're working with, of seniors are abused aged 65 plus. You've heard about theft from powers of attorney for property. Sadly, there's also abuse and neglect by powers of attorney for care. All right? So <clears throat> we'll get on to it. Let's set the stage. Let me give you some information about the current state of affairs in Toronto. Here's the good news. We're living longer. More and more of us will see our 80th, 90th, and 100th birthday. Last week, I was in Shoppers, and I picked up a birthday card. And it said, happy 80th birthday. Love, Mom and Dad. <laughs> OK? That's the good news. However, by the year 2017, there will be more seniors then there will be children under age 14. Major implications for our health care system and for family caregivers, because someone needs to be paying attention and helping out. Within the growth segment, the older seniors, 80, 85 plus, are the fastest growing segment of this demographic. What we also know for those who are 85 plus, that one in three will develop a dementia. And as you likely know, dementia is a progressive illness that will require 24-hour care. Again, major implications for our health care system and for the family caregiver. The majority of seniors are in the community <coughs> being looked after by family members with only 10% in institutions. So what we know about caring, and again for family caring, that is very, very costly. Let's spend a moment talking about the cost of care financially. I'll spend a moment talking about the Community Care Access Centre, CCAC for short. We're very lucky to live in Canada with a universal health care system. And our first stop for support is the Community Care Access System. It is our publicly funded sector. As you may know, and I'll just take a moment, there are 14 local health integration networks across the province of Ontario, and the community care access centres are divided amongst the areas. In theory, all provide the same service. In practice, it's different because each CCAC handles their own budget. So, for example, I have a family who's, who has a member with palliative care needs. The CCAC in Toronto is able to provide 21 hours a week 
of services of a PSW, which is a personal support worker, to this family. Right? They're 24 hours in a day, 21 hours a week is not an awful lot of care. More typically, what we see coming out of the CCAC and in terms of assistance for the family caregiver, for the care recipient, and I'll be interchanging the words carer, care recipient, caregiver, are uh, the services of a personal support worker for about an hour or two a week to provide supervision during bathing. All right, and the issue around bathing is around falls prevention and risk. So for one to two hours a week of care, again, it's not enough. To spend a moment about talking about private care, private care in Toronto costs about $24, $25 an hour. 24 hours in a day times $24, $25 an hour. Very expensive and very, very difficult for families to afford. What we have are some agencies who are able to provide an overnight 24-hour rate, perhaps for about $200. And there's also, through Human Resource and Skills Development Canada, the Live-In Sponsorship Caregiver Program. They work 44 to 7, 47 hours a week, and it may be a wonderful result. However, again, the majority of seniors are in the community. The majority of services coming out from the CCAC are to seniors and so the question is how much care which we've just talked about can the public sector provide and how much care is going to fall onto the shoulders of the family. The CCAC is servicing frail seniors in the community those who need assistance and again as I say supervision during bathing but they're also dealing with individuals with dementia. Now some of you may have read the Rising Tide document a wonderful document that came out from the Alzheimer's Society and it talks about dementia as a major epidemic. Today in Canada, once every five minutes, a person is diagnosed with a dementia. Okay? In the year 2038, every two minutes, someone is going to be diagnosed with dementia. Again, and dementia, as you may know, is a, is a, is a global term. Alzheimer's is being one type of dementia, but there are many. Regardless, they're progressive diseases that will end up requiring 24-hour care. I mentioned this yesterday. It really concerns me that the Alzheimer's Society do not give us the, 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 um, uh, the symptoms of the different kinds of dementia. Because I talked with a woman and she told me about um, uh, <laughs> uh, um, Something pressure hydrocephalus, and it it starts showing up early. It can be treated, and pe she said there are too many people in nursing homes with this problem that isn't being diagnosed because they're not letting us know. And I have a friend that I swear has got it, and if they get that stint in that neck there, that person can prevent it. Why don't we force the Alzheimer's? society to give us a, the symptoms of these different dementias? Thank you for your question. Um, I can't answer that. Um, there is some information online and through the, uh, there's a dementia network, the Alzheimer's Society, there are a number of resources which I will talk about as I get to community supports, but certainly it's not a, um, it's, you still need a medical opinion. Right? I mean, it's very difficult to self-diagnose, so one still needs a medical opinion to understand exactly what's, what's going on. But I'd be happy to chat with you later and give you some tips if that would be helpful for you. So I'll, I'll just continue on, and if there are more questions, perhaps we can just, I'll leave some time at the end for, for, for sure. The cost of care, emotional cost of care. So we've talked about care being provided primarily by family members. The... You, from University of Western Ontario in 2012, London Duxbury did a, a, a wonderful study um, and they interviewed 25,000 um, employees and from the 25,000 employees, 8,000 identified themselves as carers. 60% were in the sandwich generation and it's a term you may know and be familiar with. Those of us po born post the war, baby boomers, caught between the needs of our parents and caught between the needs of our children 
and we're in the sandwich, right? It's the, it's, the, it's the feeling of feeling squished, which we're going to be talking about in a moment. So from the 60% who responded to the survey, I'll just tell you what some of the results showed. They found that they were responsible for care for multiple family members living within an hour's drive to their home. Most had been caring for five to 10 years. Most were providing emotional support as well as assistance with activities of daily living, which could be feeding, bathing, toileting. 80% said they felt overwhelmed, one in three on a daily basis. 40% said they felt angry and frustrated by the demands on their time. And 60% said that the care had negatively impacted their work career. Now what the study also told us is that the average worker today is putting in over 50 hours. Right? So it's the emails, it's the time at home. And what they found in this study, there was close to an additional seven hours, 6.9, seven hours a week that was added on to the employed carer's responsibilities in terms of family caregiving. They found that the majority still were women who were providing care, but men certainly are out there and doing their fair share. What we know for the employed carer is that it impacts their work. We see absenteeism, being away from the job. We see presenteeism, a term maybe you haven't heard, which is being on the job, being present and accounted for, but really being somewhere else, being preoccupied, worrying about, I didn't hear from mom this morning. I wonder if she's okay, all right? And certainly, that was the household I grew up in. My mother spoke to my grandmother every morning, every night. So, real challenge for, for employed carers. And I'll just spend a minute um, providing you with some tips on that. So if any of you are here as an employed carer, married to an employed carer, know of, live with, or friends with an employed carer, there are some resources. And we often suggest that people talk to their employer, human resource department, to find out if they have an employee assistance provider, an EAP provider for short, who is able to provide confidential counseling, there may be ways to explore time sharing, flex hours, working from home. Again, it's a juggle, but it's trying to make life a little, a little easier. So some options for employed carers. Young carers. I was privileged to partner with the Vanier Institute for the Family. On research that they completed last year out of BC, that by Dr. Charles Grant, and he studied um, a number of high schools, went into a number of high schools, and interviewed teenagers, and found that 12% of these young people identified themselves as carers. So through partnering with the Vanier Institute um, for the Family, I produced a rap video called Lucky the Young Carer Rap, that was able, and it's a story of a young fellow who's friends with my son who is a, um, who's a rapper and a carer to both of his grandmothers. And so it's his story, and he's been able to bridge the gap between, uh, between the ages. So if you're interested at all, I encourage you to take a listen. And that too is available on the website. Um, there's also the step generation. And I'm certainly not indicating here that we're seeing more abuse with young people and old people, not at all. It's just an understanding of who's providing care out there and encouraging all of us to be more aware of what's happening within our homes and within our communities as to what the taxes and the toll is for family carers. This might be a little bit challenging for you to see, but this is the most recent study that I could find uh, because we've not received, uh, have not had the latest Stats Canada um, results come out. And I anticipate once the general social survey results come out, we'll see these numbers are actually higher than this 2009 study by Lou and Chapel that identified carers who were between age 45 to 64 and activities doing, as, we, as I briefly talked about, meal preparation, home maintenance, shopping, and assistance with the very personal activities, bathing, toileting, care of toenails, fingernails. The average for the carer between the age of 45 to 64 was just under eight hours a week, 7.9 hours a week. For the older carer, who's between 65 plus, they found that they were spending over 10 hours a week, 10.4 hours a week providing additional care. 
So numbers are probably even higher than that. And if any of you can think about your own situations or those that you know, you know how involved and how many hours you're putting in providing care. So what happens? Here's the concern, and we've heard about it today. Caregiver burnout. The message that I want to make sure I, I leave you with today is that you're not alone. Carers feel isolated, often having unrealistic expectations of what they can provide. And in fact, what happens is that all of their energy gets depleted and they have nothing left to give, all right? Empty. Feeling stressed over long periods of a time will affect the carer's health motivation and attitude. And it's also going to affect the caregiver's ability to cope with daily responsibilities. Caring is a two-way street, right? I call it a dyad relationship. It's a partnership between the caregiver and the care recipient. And when we talk about abuse and neglect, it can also happen both ways. We've been involved in situations where the individual who's had the dementia has attacked their own partner, their, love, their, their wife or, or husband, who is the caregiver, right? And, that, and that's the disease. But nonetheless, it's an abuse situation that required intervention. Again, going both ways. We've talked a little bit about employed carers and it's time away and being uh, off sick or taking leaves of absence because of mental health days and an increase of mental health days. What's so important is that caregivers Build in time for themselves. Take care of themselves. Find an avenue, find some resources. And we'll talk a little bit about respite care and some of what some of those resources are and how to get the family talking. It doesn't all have to fall on the shoulders of the adult child who didn't get married or the adult child who lives closest to mom or dad or the adult child who just seems to want to do more than everybody else. What's going to help? It's important that you speak up. Other people cannot read your mind. And there is often a feeling of guilt and feeling ashamed of, I'm supposed to be able to do this. Or no one can look after my mother, father, husband, wife, as well as I can. And that's when these unrealistic expectations get set up and without having the resources built in, it can be detrimental to everybody's health. And in fact, is what we see, are the, these are some of the situations that can lead to neglect and abuse. Things like bringing a prepared meal, as simple as that. Offering to come by so you can have uh, time to go to the gym. Time to go out for a movie with a friend. Whatever it's going to take, to re-energize and refill your, your gauges, your energy, your emotional, your spiritual, your physical gas tanks are, are, are run down to zero. Some signs of abuse. So I'm going to read these out to you. And if they sound familiar, for yourself, or if you have had a conversation with a friend about this, then it's perhaps time to think, aha, I need some assistance. I need to get some help for myself, or perhaps I can offer some assistance to my friend, my sister, my neighbor. So some of the signs. I'm always tired. I don't sleep well. I get sick more than usual. I have gained or lost weight unintentionally. I have back pain, headaches, feelings of fatigue and depression. I don't have time for myself. I have given up hobbies and reduced contact with friends and family. I have a short temper and outbursts of anger. I cry easily. I worry about not having enough money to make ends meet. I feel I don't have enough knowledge or experience to give proper care. And this is from Veterans Affairs Canada. Some of the other uh, symptoms that I've added to this are I feel ashamed of myself, 
and I feel guilty. I feel guilty when I can't do enough. Caregiving can be extremely demanding. So if you are experiencing caregiver burnout, again, it's time to talk to a counselor, talk to family, talk to friends about getting some help for yourself. One of the assessment tools that I provide when I'm sitting down with a family is the caregiver burnout scale. Because again, in this relationship, it takes two to provide and receive care. So it's very important that this dyad is working well together. Families are complex. Do I need to tell you that? One of my favorite expressions is the only normal families out there are the families you don't know. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? It means we all have our histories. We all have our baggage. I have to tell you, I've been so impressed with some of the families that I've met. Okay, the majority of families that I've met who hire our services can't do enough. I had a recent situation of, uh, of a fellow, uh, a 90-year-old gentleman in, in Ottawa who had fallen and had hurt himself and was hospitalized. And it was the first time he had ever been hospitalized. Amazing is that, but very healthy fellow. And the son called me, who was a, um, a working professional here in Toronto, and his brother lived in Washington, and he too was a, a working professional. And in addition to hiring uh, a social worker in the Ottawa area where their dad lived through us, they flew up every weekend, was in touch every night with, our, with the care manager and the dad to ensure that their dad had the proper care and attention and wasn't going to fall through the cracks. So couldn't do enough because they couldn't physically be there. Wonderful, wonderful sons. There are also those children who you think, oh my gosh, I had one daughter approach me about services and she said, you know, I really don't like my mother, but I don't want her eating cat food. Okay? So, families are complicated. When we have powers of attorney, so Mark spoke very eloquently about powers of attorney and maybe scared you a little bit into some questions to ask about who is going to be there to speak for you when you can no longer speak for yourself. Those are the other situations that we get called in where there's conflicts. So I'll just uh, I'll, I'll spend a moment um, telling you about one such story. And um, again, it was a, a shared power of attorney situation where the the son, and this goes to my next point, the black sheep and the prodigal son, was the son who was home looking after mom, was the son who was living in the basement. He himself had not been able to, mm, failure to launch, maybe is a term, you know, really been able to establish himself, to work successfully, um, had his own issues, and also kept dogs. Mom lived upstairs, he lived in the basement. And so at the point that I was called in, he had come upstairs with his dogs and the dogs had pushed his mother over and she had fallen. And so the concern was raised by the other children. Neglect, all right? And we talked about whether it's willful neglect or um, neglect that happens, lack of information, lack of knowledge. Black sheep and prodigal son, and that's a wonderful article that, that uh, that comes from abroad, but I'd be happy to share that. The other kind of marriages and situations we see for concern are called predatory marriages. And uh, both of the previous speakers uh, talked a little bit about that. I had the privilege of attending the NICE conference last week, the National Initiatives for Care for the Elderly. And um, wonderful organization. And, and um, Professor Oosterhoff from University of Western Ontario spoke on predatory marriages. And this is his quote, uh, how do I love thee, let me count the days. All right, and so what we see, and there's been some very interesting stories that ha again are out there in the public venue, uh, what they have in common is that it's often a, a care giver who is a younger, 
often a woman, younger individual, who has somehow been able to um, move their way into um, perhaps a caregiving relationship and then some. But what they all have in common is that the um, care recipient is always much older and much richer. I think uh, the concern is when that person is in fact that much richer. So other things to be aware of, and again, uh, Leslie spoke a little bit about that in terms of what, what do you do and how do you do it. And again, it goes back to capacity, right? If you've got capacity, you make your own choices. And as adult children, we may not like our adults, our parents' choices, but it's their choices to make if in fact they're capable. So what do you do? Well, again, caregivers feel isolated. The majority have waited five years before asking for help. That's an awfully long time. Again, majority say they have not received consistent care from family members. Inform yourself. Regardless of the disease group, there are support organizations whether it is multiple sclerosis, whether it is cancer, whether it is heart and stroke, they all have education available at their offices or online, and the majority of them offer support groups. Very important to know what's ahead. Is the disease progressive, such as multiple sclerosis or dementia? Is it short term? Is someone going to now recover from a broken hip? Or perhaps a urinary tract infection? And if any of you have had one or have been with someone who's had them, their personality can change overnight. And yet, with treatment of antibiotics, they can go back to their baseline. So is what's ahead of me going to be short term, long term, or progressive? very important for the planning process. What we also know is that many carers don't trust their instinct and wait until they've been depleted and don't have the energy. So before you get to that point is what we're encouraging you to seek assistance, build in some respite care, and follow your own instincts if you feel that something has gone amiss. Family meeting, so important and not easy to do to get the entire family around the table to talk about a plan of care for their parent. It's an opportunity for a discussion of fears, of concerns, of needs, of looking at arrangements. Families are complex. If there are money and care situations to be arranged, I always recommend that it's fully transparent, that there's no surprises. We're often seeing caregiver agreements where there's money exchanged or services in lieu of. Have it spelled out very, very clearly. The family meeting is an opportunity to understand what the options and resources are available. So one can make an informed choice for whatever it is, bringing care in or saying, you know what, this is no longer manageable and I need help and I can't do it myself or the home is no longer safe. And that's another reason certainly why lots of people move is because their home, for whatever reason, is no longer either accessible and care is no longer affordable, which might be some of the reasons for a move. Again, it doesn't have to fall onto the shoulders of one person. So how do you have these family meetings? Well, sometimes it can be a social worker, a counselor. There are elder mediators out there who are able to do that. Sometimes it can be a, a physician, a clergy, or it can be a neighbor who's concerned. The important thing is, is that third party objective individual will not have their buttons pushed. My mother can push my own buttons, okay? But she's not gonna push your buttons. Similarly, 
your parent or your child isn't going to push my buttons, right? But because of the family histories and how things are interwoven and the sibling rivalries that get carried through the years, it becomes very complex. I had one, I had one uh, family that I worked with and I was in the home of the older individual and uh, the 60 year old daughter who was, the daughter was the primary caregiver for her mom who was 90 and had dementia. And we were talking about care at home and the respite that she had and she said, you know Audrey, every time I hire a caregiver to help me out, my brother fires them. What do you suggest? Are you able to change my relationship with my brother? And I said, wow, if I could change the relationship you have with your brother, I'd be on the Oprah show, right? <laughs> I'd be a millionaire. No, I'm not going to be able to change the relationships that you have with your siblings or with your children. But my job is to ensure that I can put the family on the same page of care for their parent, right? That, that's the main thing for me. The other thing is about not making promises. I think that was in Mark's list of the don'ts. Don't make promises. We don't know what's around the corner, truly. And the most important thing we can do is, is try and respect the other person's wishes as best we can. But we also have to know our own limits. And they may be emotional and they may be financial. I had a meeting last week of um, three, three daughters who had been fighting uh, about care for their mom for years. And their mom has a, a genetic hereditary condition and two of the daughters has the same genetic hereditary condition. And mom had been in and out of the hospital and uh, the, the nurse said, you know, your mom, and mom had lived alone up to this point, your mom needs help and we don't think she's safe living at home. Um, we're recommending placement and long-term care unless she can live with one of you. So one of the daughters who happened to be a nurse said, absolutely, Mom's going to come back and live with me. Now, this daughter has the same hereditary condition. This daughter had, was already on a, a stress leave for her own issues, but was ready to take mom home. So the conversation around the dining room table was to look at what kind of resources could be brought into the house to make this manageable. But each adult daughter needed to be able to voice what they could give and what they felt they could not. And it did not mean that they loved their mother any less. Okay, and that's the message that the other siblings had to hear. It wasn't above or about, I love you better. I love you differently and I'm at my limit and I cannot do any more. Okay, and there is absolutely no shame in being able to say that. We try plan A, we build in the resources and the supports and the evaluation so we can be sure that we can readjust should plan A not be manageable any longer for a change of condition or a change of whatever might happen. Okay, so it's understanding and planning and knowing what some of these resources are. Respite care. How many letters is respite care? Six, seven, eight. Very important word to know, all right? It needs to be part of every carer's week, day, integration. The Community Care Access Center, I've spoken very briefly about it. Um, limited in what they can provide, however, available to you should you need it. Wonderful, wonderful resource of day programs in the community. Elderly Persons Center is what they're called. And they are able to offer support. Many offer day programs where transportation might be available, where they can pick up the senior, take them to an activity. The senior is provided with a hot lunch, stimulation, exercise program, whatever it might be, and that caregiver can either have a break for a day or, in fact, may attend with their care recipient and join a support group that's likely being offered at the same time. 
Many of our community sports programs do that. So very important, there's a lot of information out there through the seniors organizations and I've, I've given you one phone number to jot down for that. There are also private options. So we've talked about hiring a personal support worker, a PSW, which is the name, and my preference is always to hire from an agency, just so, although it may cost a little more, uh, we know that that individual is trained, bonded, has reference checks been verified, and most importantly for me, there's backup should that caregiver be sick. While it may be less expensive to hire a private carer, that's the piece you're missing. And in Toronto, a private carer is anywhere between $13 to $15 an hour. Again, hiring from an agency, $23, $24, $25 an hour. Some of the organizations uh, offer services on a sliding scale, depending on the senior's ability to pay. So, and the other, other tip that I'll leave you with that is if you are already in receipt of services from a publicly funded sector such as the CCAC and if you hire additional care privately, the HST can be waived. So that's a big cost savings. Okay, so, and you have to ask for it, unfortunately. So that's a, a takeaway for you for today. The other um, phone number I'm going to give you was one that Leslie had al already put on her slide, the senior safety line. So what we've heard is that while the police may be called in to investigate, part of their job is to also ensure, of course, number one is the safety, but what resources can be built in to try and support the caregiver. Right, so very, very important. So community navigation, 1877, and uh, it's a Monday to Friday line, but I believe you can leave a phone number over the weekend. Sorry, what does retirement? Ah, sorry, did I skip over that? Sorry. Uh, retirement, thank you. Um, many retirement residences offer short-term stays. <clears throat> Overnight, yeah, convalescent or respite. So if people are being discharged from the hospital and not quite ready to go home, or for a care needs to take a holiday, take a break, or is wanting to go on a uh, business trip, retirement residences, some, have model suites available, either in uh, different sections, some are in, in more support is available, for about $100 a day. Right, so a wonderful way to try it out, and that's often one of the things I also recommend if people are considering a move into retirement, great way to try it out. Okay. The other thing that's available is through the long-term care facility, and, and some of you may not know this already, but for eligible Ontario residents, you are allowed up to 90 days a year of respite care in a long-term care facility, $35 a day. Okay, so again, as you know, long-term care facilities are highly, highly subsidized. Um, private room, $2,200 a month, a shared room, 17, and a ward room at $1,400 a month. But uh, one night stay, $35. And again, you have to go through your community care access center, you have to be eligible, and book that well in advance if you've got a trip coming up or you want to uh, avail yourself of that. Um, a, a great way to go. Thank you for, thank you for that. So, in summary, how do we be better prepared? Abuse happens, neglect happens, and we've heard today there are a number of reasons why this occurs. And it's complicated, and every family is different. But I believe we can be better prepared and we can build in some of our safety checks. We've heard about powers of attorney. I often recommend that a financial institution be the power of attorney or become the power of attorney uh, for an individual. And sometimes they can work with the power of attorney for finance as a safeguard. While there are no organizations that I am aware of who are happy to pick up a power of attorney for care, and the, 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 um, the official guardian's office will for situations, um, it often falls to family or to a distant relative. Um, certainly in our work, we uh, work with a lot of um, often single women who have not married, uh, do not have children, 
and so the POA for care is uh, designated to a distant niece or nephew that may not know Aunt Mary very well. So we're often asked to get involved and to work with that power of attorney uh, to ensure that there's a professional guiding the process. Ultimately, the decision rests with the power of attorney. It's not our decision. We're only there to recommend. The other thing that I've seen work very, very nicely is when uh, friends come up to the plate and assume the role of power of attorney. Uh, we had a, a, a lovely, lovely woman who had multiple sclerosis um, and has just sadly recently passed away. She was divorced. She had children. She didn't want to rely on them to be her power of attorney, okay, and chose her three best friends. And together, they were able to share the responsibility because it was a huge responsibility. Fortunately, we were able to work with them and do much of the groundwork, right, as we helped support their, their friend in her home and then to retirement and then ultimately to long-term care where she passed away. But there's some options out there, so it's important to think about that. Wills, just one of those necessary things to get done. And advanced directives, so important. Who, who's going to be helping you make those decisions? And this is where they get written down. Okay? The other thing I'll leave you with is know where these important papers are kept. Okay, tell your power of attorney where they are or where the key to the safety deposit box is kept. Okay, I mean, it's just something we take for granted and uh, it just, it, it gets missed. In conclusion, uh, there's no easy fix to this, but for those of you who are in the caring role, whether you are a caregiver, a care recipient, a friend or a family or a neighbor, I hope you've taken away from today some tips and resources so you can speak up, you can offer a hand, and you can be involved in trying to prevent uh, some of the ugliness that can occur that we have out there. So thank you.